Mauricio Rodriguez from the Chicana Chicano Studies Program at Community College. And this is the fourth interview in a series of lectures entitled Las Platicas, funded by a grant by the National Endowment for the Humanities. We're here today with Dr. Alicia Gaspar de Alba from the University of California at Los Angeles, Cesar e. Chavez Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies, where she serves as chair and professor for the department. Aside from her academic career, Dr. Gaspar de Alba is a gifted writer whose work includes Velvet Barrios, Popular Culture and Chicana, Chicano Sexualities, La Llorona on the Longfellow Bridge, Poetry y Otras Movidas, The Mystery of Survival and Other Stories, Chicano Art Inside and Outside the Master's House, and Sor Juana's Second Dream. Her most recent novel is entitled Desert Blood, The Juarez Murders, a fictionalized version of the very real atrocities plaguing our border community, and the subject of her second public, public platica here at the college. Dr. Gaspar Dalla, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we've had three other scholars here, Dr. Juan Bruce Nova from UC Irvine, Dr. Ruben Cordova now at Sarah Lawrence College, and Dr. Emma Perez from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Each of these academics has lent their thoughts with us regarding the often problematic issue of defining Chicana or Chicano. One of the goals of this lecture series is to achieve a better understanding of the issue through an interdisciplinary approach of the identification. Dr. Gaspar de Alba, would you share your definition of what it means to be Chicana or Chicano and how your own work speaks to that definition? Well, you know that that's like my favorite, least favorite question, right? But um, one of the things that we always have to do for every single, I always have to do for every single generation of students at UCLA is to speak to that question. And it's always the, you know, the, the answer always changes. Uh, there's one fundamental thing for me, and that is uh, that it is a, a Chicano or Chicana is somebody who recognizes themselves as Chicano and Chicana. Um, it's a politicized Mexican-American, but also no longer limited to just being Mexican or to being Mexican-American. There are a lot of uh, first-generation immigrant Mexicanos who have grown up in this country and who affiliate you know, politically with the goals of the Chicano movement and who call themselves Chicanos and Chicanas. So we can no longer keep the definition focused on just ethnicity or nationality. Uh, but it is based on an understanding uh, and an awareness of your Mexican history, Mexican culture, Latino culture, and uh, particularly issues of you know identity and language. So it's a very broad definition. It doesn't help, I'm sure, people who are looking for that you know uh, textbook definition or the or the uh, definition they're gonna find in a dictionary. If you look it up in a dictionary, it says an American of Mexican descent, which is a very you know, depoliticized uh, sort of response, except that now, of course, we know that nothing is depoliticized, right? And I think that uh, if you look into the original goals of the Chicano movement, the aspect of being proud of your indigenous heritage, being proud of your um, Spanish language, and also being aware of your history. These are the three like, main things and advocating as much as possible for the empowerment of your community and for um, the uh, process of self-determination, determining your own destiny, your own economic and cultural destiny. Yes, the issue is obviously problematic. Um, in discussing or even mentioning the word Chicano, I found that the public or students' reactions to the identity of Chicano or Chicano is often rooted in the image of the movement. Um, what would you say are some of the defining qualities of the movement that sprouted the concept for this particular field of study? And how has this identity formation different now in what we would call the post-movement, or what scholars would refer to now as being more aptly described as a post-movement beyond the 60s and 70s? You know, I don't... I don't really believe that we're in a post-movement. I think we're in a different aspect of the movement. Because anything that says post means it's after the movement, and it makes us think of the movement as, as one singular uh, thing that was located in, in one you know, particular aspect of time, the 60s and the 70s. And that was one you know, face of the movement. And even that had many multiple branches. When I teach that class at UCLA, the first thing I do is I debunk the notion of el movimiento, right? I put el in quotation marks because it's not one movement. You can put el movimiento in, in a circle in the middle of a page, and then you do all these branches, and you realize that you know el movimiento included the student branch, the cultural branch. Uh, it included people doing you know all forms of, of art, 
teatro and visual art and, and floricanto and all of that part of that was known as a cultural renaissance. Uh, it included the more militant, militant aspect, which is the Brown Berets. And really the Brown Berets were only militant uh, in the sense that they were willing to like throw down for, you know, for empowering youth and for educating youth. And they were actually very involved and very, um, very much part of the, you know, you've heard of the blowouts, the high school blowouts that they, some say, you know, ignited the Chicano movement in LA that, you know, had all those high school students walking out of their high schools, just like we saw in that recent PBS, right? Was it PBS? HBO documentary. HBO documentary, right. right. Uh, that, that ignited a little a little process of, of new uh, of new walkouts, but but it was the Brown Berets who organized those originally, and it's not so much that they were about fighting and about uh, you know just uh, creating a bunch of noise and calling attention to themselves. They were actually advocating for something very real, which was a relevant education for the Mexican American youth that were the majority in these schools. So I think that right now what we're in is um, what I like to call the the intellectual movement, the intellectual activists. And that's what I teach my students at UCLA, that we're all involved in a new pleito. And that pleito is going to happen in the classrooms and in the boardrooms and in those places where we now have access, because there's so many more of us with an, with an education and with higher degrees. And just because we have those higher degrees doesn't mean we abandon our mission which is always to serve our community, which is always to educate and empower our community, and to advocate and create access for other people coming behind us. But that has to happen uh, on, a, on a level that is like an intellectual level, as opposed to a protesting out in the streets or boycotting and striking, because that, I mean, that continues in, in some areas, but that's not always the most effective battle. And the way that politically our climate in this country right now is such that People will are, are are more apt to see us, you know, let us starve to death than to meet our demands. So it's like, no, we have to get smart. We have to learn how to use the master's tools, uh, because that's what we have to fight with, you know. And in the process, we develop our own tools and we recreate ourselves. Do you think maybe that situation creates a problematic, whereas? Because it's no longer a grassroots movement, people maybe become detached or disenfranchised, and then depend upon those who have been become part of the system to enact that change. Uh, for example, an academic such as yourself, who is now in a position to enact that change from within. Do people become detached or somewhat uh, removed from the process? Well, only if you believe that your work, once you leave the academy, is not going to impact your community anymore. If you are such that you're going to school only to get a degree to get you into that high paying office, uh, to get you into that white collar job, and that you know, you're dying to leave your community and never get back to it, uh, then I can see detachment happening, but that's not really the case. I, I know that with my students at UCLA, they're very committed to going back home, going back to their communities, going back to their families, and serving in any way possible. And in that sense, um, they're taking what they've learned of their culture, their their history, their identity, you know, back home where that stuff wasn't taught, and trying to make a difference there. You see, and in that way we create a bridge between the academy and the grassroots because we have to we have to stop reifying that grand canyon that exists between the two right the